Srivastava. I'm a cardiologist at Pentucket Medical in Haverhill. I'm here for another episode of Matters of the Heart, brought to you by Haverhill Community Television, as well as Pentucket Medical Cardiology. I'm joined once again by, uh, by one of my associates, Dr. Seth Bilazarian, for another topic uh, regarding cardiovascular disease. And today what we're going to talk about is um, actually something that sounds relatively simple, but actually has been more complicated of late, and that is aspirin. We're going to talk a little bit about the role of aspirin if you want to take it preventatively or if you're taking it after you've had a cardiovascular event and what the differences are between those two scenarios um, because there are differences. And so with that, I will um, hand it over to Dr. Bill Azarian and uh, what can you tell us about aspirin? Sure, well, you mentioned the, the issue for prevention of cardiovascular disease. So of course, everybody doesn't want to have a stroke. People don't want to have a heart attack. So just to get clarify something that often is difficult for patients to understand. When we talk about the artery placking process, that's narrowing of the arteries or hardening of the arteries. That process is called atherosclerosis. It's the narrowing that we think comes from cholesterol, smoking, diabetes, family history. Those kinds of things contribute to the narrowing of the artery. But those, that narrowing almost never causes a heart attack or a stroke. What happens on top of that is a clot will form and physicians refer to this as a thrombus or thrombosis. And doctors have put these two words together and call it atherothrombosis to refer to the whole thing. From the beginning when at a young age, even at age 18, Americans begin developing the plaque or <coughs> atherosclerosis, and then that narrowing develops over time, and at some point a clot forms and causes a heart attack or stroke, the atherothrombosis. So we prevent the first part with cholesterol medicines and blood pressure, but we prevent the second part, the thrombosis, with medicines that thin blood. And aspirin is the oldest of these. And I think some people don't take it very seriously because it's an old medicine and it's inexpensive and it's generically available and all these kinds of things. But it really is a powerful medicine and trying to use it correctly has been a, a source of a lot of, 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 of uh, um, uh, papers in our journals of late. So before we even talk more about aspirin, there are other medications that are similar that work on the platelets. Can you just review what some of those are? Sure. Well, there's, before we do that, so okay. just to review for, pay, for our audience what platelets are. Platelets right. are these little tiny things. They're much smaller than red blood cells and white blood cells that circulate in our blood. And they're just constantly looking for a cut in the wall of the artery or the blood vessel to, to go stick to and stop bleeding. That's what platelets are. They're the first line of defense to stop bleeding. So doctors say that when they see, when they see, you know, obviously I'm personifying the platelet, but when, when, they, when they're around something that uh, 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 is identified as a source of bleeding, they activate, they release their, these chemicals, then they um, uh, adhere or stick to the wall of the artery to try to cover it over, make a mesh that, that stops the bleeding, and then they stick together, they aggregate. So they do all these things, and aspirin is one thing that makes them do that less. So of course, it's a kind of blood thinner, uh, it's, as I said, the oldest one, but there are some others we've talked about on prior episodes here of Matters of the Heart, like Plavix or Clopidogrel, Brilinta or Ticagrelor, or Prasigl or Effiant are newer antiplatelet medicines, a kind of blood thinner that is an antiplatelet medicine. Got it. Okay. And those latter medications, we don't talk about those so much in the um, context of primary prevention, where, you know, as an older gentleman, you go and you buy a bottle of aspirin because you want to pop an aspirin a day to prevent heart attack or stroke. These other medications are not for that, correct? Yes, I would say so. As of now. As yeah. of now, yes, as exactly now. right. Um, so let's talk about aspirin then and its role in prevention. Um, you know, for years we've always told people, it's, the age changes, but you know, you get to 50 or 55, you know, take an aspirin a day and that'll prevent a heart attack or stroke. Does that still hold? Yeah, so that's the thing that's really in the news lately. So um, when I came into practice now 23 years ago, it was aspirin pretty much for everybody over 50. Yeah. But over the last 10 years or so, it's become increasingly recognized that women don't seem to derive the same benefit. In large studies, aspirin has really been shown to really fall short in giving a good benefit. And of course, with any medicine, including aspirin, there is a hazard. There's a bleeding hazard. There's ulcer problems. And the biggest thing we worry about is bleeding in the brain, which can happen with any medicine, but certainly with aspirin as well. So for all of these things, it's been thought that maybe men should be treated with it, but women really shouldn't be. So that's we've moved from aspirin for everybody who's older to maybe just aspirin for men. But now the, the, our guidelines have taken a little bit step further for, again, we're talking only about primary prevention. I wanna be really clear with our audience. We're not talking about someone who's already had a heart attack, or already has had a stroke, or has a stent put in. 
Those patients have already had something, so that we want to prevent a second thing or secondary prevention, so we want them to stay on aspirin for life. We're now talking only about primary prevention. So that's, a, I think, a very important, just, I've had several patients come in in the last six months or so, say, oh, I just read that aspirin's bad for me, or, or it's not doing me any good, so I've stopped it. And these are folks who have had heart attack or bypass surgery or strokes, and, and it takes a lot of undoing of, of so there, I think it's important to differentiate primary prevention and secondary prevention. Yes, that's, I think that that's absolutely so. So we will talk about that briefly if we have time, but to talk now about primary prevention, uh, a, a paper in one of our journals called the Journal of the American College of Cardiology recently uh, came out with uh, an evaluation from a very large database looking at practices like ours all around the country, and they found that physicians were using aspirin in a real different ways around. So there's not sort of a, a consistent use of aspirin around practices. And they, they said that physicians, of course, should try to follow the guidelines. And the guidelines that they use is that if a, someone has a, about 6% risk or greater of a cardiovascular event using a specific score, a calculator, which, which patients can get on the internet, called the Framingham 10-Year Risk of General Cardiovascular Disease. <coughs> this is a calculator that was developed in Framingham, Massachusetts, that looks at not just the chance of death or heart attack, which the first Framingham score did, but looks at the chance of stroke or needing an angioplasty or bypass surgery. So any of the cardiovascular things that can happen to you over 10 years. And if your risk is greater than 6%, then aspirin is recommended. If it's less than 6%, aspirin is thought to be not beneficial because your risk is too low to really get a benefit from it. Got it. And this is male or female or? Right, right. So if the Framingham risk calculator has a gender part, male or female, has cholesterol, high blood pressure, diabetes, cigarette smoking, has a variety of things that can be inputted that are very easy to do and then basically can give you a score for that for 10 years. So now what's the downside of taking an aspirin on a daily basis? People coming in, oh, I heard there's a risk of colon cancer or there's a risk of something else. Is there anything that they point to in there that um, we should counsel patients on? Well, I think that generally speaking, the risk of aspirin is largely related to a bleeding risk. Um, I, I'm not sure about the colon cancer risk myself. Yeah. I, I think the data is, is, is uh, is quite right. scattered. I'm not sure what your reading of the data is, but one of think, thinking about colon cancer is that if you have an early colon cancer, if you take an aspirin, you may bleed a little into your colon and your stool samples may turn blood, and that could actually be an early way to identify colon cancer right. rather than the fact it's actually causing colon cancer, because there's no real way for us to understand how aspirin would actually cause colon cancer. Sure. Is, right. that, is that your understanding? Yeah, no, absolutely. I've, I've never really understood, I've never had I agree with everything you said. I've never been able to tease out that there's a higher risk of colon cancer right. with aspirin usage. So it may be actually a theoretical benefit to identifying it earlier by identifying blood in the stool as an example. Right. But certainly, again, we don't want to take any risk if there's not a benefit. So that, that, that's really what we're dr drilling down to. We're saying, look, if there's a high enough risk, there's a, a, a benefit with aspirin, let's make sure we get it to some level. And the, the, the risks, the, the um, level they've said is, you could argue is somewhat arbitrary, maybe it should be higher. But at some point we would all agree, if someone has no chance of a cardiovascular issue, why take an aspirin? What's, there's right. no benefit in that. So I think that the, that the thinking around this is solid and good. It's trying to personalize or individualize risks and benefits for a patient, having a conversation with them to say, you know, based on this score, these are your data, with this I would or wouldn't recommend it. So you mentioned the, uh, the risk calculator, the Framingham risk calculator and coming out with a number of 6%. Um, how do we, trans you know, so an average patient who walks into my office, 50-year-old 50, 50 guy comes into my office, no medical problems whatsoever, you know, no blood pressure problems, no nothing, no problems whatsoever. Does that put him at the 6% range? Is he someone who should be going on an aspirin? Yeah, so it's pretty interesting. So, um, and, and I'll just say before I answer your question that there are other risk estimators. There's another one that the American Heart Association came out with last year called the ASCVD estimator, which is largely now being used for cholesterol evaluation, but that could also be used for the same purpose to try to get a risk. So some people have criticized different risk estimators. One criticism of Framingham, which I'll say as an aside, is that, that there's not a lot of, of racial or ethnic diversity in the group that was studied in Framingham. So others have come up with other estimators done in other parts of the country where there may be perhaps more African Americans or other racial ethnic groups, as an example. But I think, again, it's not unreasonable to say, you know, we, we should use some kind of tool to try to help understand the risks. But your specific question is, what do you do with a 50-year-old guy I started this program today by saying it used to be every 50-year-old guy should be on it. 
And as it turns out, that's pretty much what this approach says as well. If you go in and you play with this risk estimator, and you put in 50-year-old man, and you make all the other numbers fantastic, fantastic cholesterol, fantastic blood pressure, no diabetes, no smoking, and you go through all of them and make the person really, really healthy, they still come out as over 6%, and therefore asthma will be recommended for a man. And what about with women? So for a woman, that's a little different. So if you put a woman in with excellent numbers again, you have to get her to age 67 or 68 before she gets to 6%. But that's also consistent with what we think about cardiovascular disease, how men, women are often delayed about 10, or in this case, more than 10 years from having a cardiovascular event. So I think that, that this is very consistent with the way we think about these risks. So we've talked about aspirin in the setting of primary prevention. And just to be clear for the audience and the viewing members, primary prevention, I guess the way to think about it is, you've not yet had a problem, you've not yet had your heart attack or your stroke and you're trying to do this preventatively before that, versus secondary prevention, you've had a heart attack, you've had a stroke, and now you're trying to prevent a recurrent one. So we're talking about primary prevention here. Right. In the setting of secondary prevention, so I've had my heart attack, I'm on aspirin, actually there's a lot of other things I could be on too, but it's a very different recommendation now. I could yes. be 36, but the recommendation is still aspirin Right, because you already had your event at 36, right. yes. So I'm a high-risk individual yes, versus... Exactly. So. Yes, exactly, um, yes. Now, we, there are other, we, we, we have only a few more minutes left, but at the very beginning we mentioned a few other antiplatelet types of medications. And, um, you know, these largely come into play after someone gets a stent put in the heart, for example. So maybe you can give us a quick little update on what the... Because for a long time we used to keep people on both aspirin and one of these fancier blood thinner medications f for as long as we want, as long as we could. And we've cut it back down, and now often after someone gets a certain type of stent put in, we keep them on it for a year on both of these. What's the latest re guideline or recommendation with yes, this? Yes, and, and, and it can be very frustrating for patients, but I would say it's actually should be not something that causes patients frustration, but they should actually be encouraged that there's continually new data that's helping inform us on how to best treat them. But you're right. It used to be aspirin plus the drug Plavix or the generic name clopidogrel for one-year recommendation. Then it was thought that maybe it makes sense to stop the second one and only continue aspirin after that. But now the, the, the uh, pendulum may be swinging back to say for a, certainly a high risk patient. And again, that's the difference. You and I in our practice participated in a study called the Pegasus study looking at this very question. Can we or should we treat patients beyond that one year with one of these newer drugs? And it was shown to be positive in that it did protect people from another heart attack or other problem but the study only looked at people who were at higher risk. It wasn't just had a heart attack or just had a stent. It was that plus something else like diabetes, right. kidney dysfunction, multiple arteries blocked. So there's a variety of markers that you and I would think make sense as it marks people as higher risk. But from a secondary prevention standpoint, I think there's no question of that we should be on at least one of those drugs. But there's still, we're still sorting out in our practice community about uh, whether two drugs are better than one for long-term use. Yeah, and no doubt it's frustrating for a patient, and certainly as a clinician, where things change all the time. And, yes. Um, I think patients sometimes start to lose confidence in the, right. in the system, yes. so to speak. Yes, um, it's, yes. It is, it, it's, it's frustrating but simultaneously exciting. Yeah. But I did want to ask you, and I think this is a, not, again, one of those questions I like to ask you here in public. <laughs> that's an unanswerable question. But, you know, we like to make it think that it's primary or secondary. But, of course, like many things in life, it's often a little bit more gray than that. You said a person who's never had any kind of history, um, <clears throat> but... Um, and a, as a primary prevention, a person who's had a history of secondary prevention, but there's a group that's in the middle, and I don't know what to do about them, and I want to hear what you have to say. There are certain EKG patterns that indicate that a patient might have had a prior heart attack, or they have an abnormal stress test, or they have some kind of abnormality on their carotid ultrasound. Yeah. What do you think about all those? Yeah, I mean, uh, I mean so if someone's got some sign of some blockage that's yet they have not yet had a stroke. I think of that as them having vascular disease. Okay. I think of them as higher risk and treat them with antiplatelet therapy, statins, and things like that. Okay. Um, you know, the EKG pattern, I'm a little less, uh, you know, I find that to be somewhat nonspecific at times um, in the absence of any obvious clinical event and obvious any other sign on other imaging of any heart, heart attack. I don't get as jazzed up of that one okay. um, as much, but 
Yeah. But I'm just highlighting for yeah. us how it can be a challenge. Yeah. And we are actually going to cut you off here because we are starting to run out of time. Uh, but it was a good, you know, it, I was actually looking forward to hearing about this because there's so much in the news and every day there's something new or different about something as simple as, as what we think of as simple with aspirin. So thank you for that review. Um, and I'm sure in six months we could probably have another discussion about this and have totally different points of view again. Okay. Um, so with that, we will wrap this up. Uh, that was another episode of Matters of the Heart. It was brought to you by Pentucket Medical Cardiology as well as Haverhill Community Television. Thank you for joining us.